everybody, welcome back to another fantastic episode of Title Tuesdays. My name is Kevin Thatcher, the founder and CEO here at Independence Title, also known as your Title King. Today we are talking about the real estate contract. We're going to talk about the contract that was dated April 2017. That is the most recent contract that we have a lot of questions on. People call our office every single day to ask questions about how to properly fill out or how to understand the contract. So I just want to go through the contract of what we look for as a title company on the contract to make sure that you are filling it out properly, but also a couple of tips and tricks to make it a little bit easier for the settlement company or the lender that is reviewing this contract in order to get ready for closing. But first, what I'd like you to always do is click the thumbs up button, give me a like below, because this video is going to be amazing. I'm gonna take you onto my computer and we are going to go through the most recent contract in all of the fill in the blank sections. Remember, the contracts here in the state of Florida are fill in the blank. It's not drafted by an attorney. They are fill in the blank. Realtors will typically help you fill out these contracts if you're hiring one to facilitate your closing. So let's go on the computer, check it out, and I'll walk you through line by line how to make sure you're doing it properly. So as you see here, this is the as is residential contract for sale and purchase. Down at the bottom of page one, you're gonna see the date. This is the revision of April 2017. So that's the most recent contract that we are going to be reviewing. As you see here, line one, that is going to be the seller. One of the common mistakes that we see with this section is that people are putting owner of record as seller. All that means is now somebody else has to do the work to find out who actually owns the property. But I'm gonna give you a little tip. If you go to your local property appraiser site, you are going to see someone listed on there. That is typically the legal title holder of the property unless something else was done that was not recorded in public record. So what I want you to do is that name should match up with your seller, the person that is going to be signing the contract. If not, you should ask the question as to what is different, why is it different, and, and we can hopefully get, get ahead of the game by getting this information. So you're going to put the seller's name, and what I always tell people is put, if it's individuals, put their marital status. That is going to help the title company handle this transaction much easier. They do not have to keep asking, are you single, are you married? It will make it very easy. So if you have two people and they're married, husband and wife, wife and husband, maybe two single people, a single man and a single man, a single woman, a single woman, whatever their marital status is, put that on the contract to, to make it a little bit easier for everyone that is reviewing it. Then we go to the buyer. This is going to be the buyer of the property. Again, it, it seems very simple, but you wanna put the buyer, you wanna put their marital status, and most importantly, make sure the names are correct because a lot of times we see misspellings. So make sure the names are correct on there because that is the information that will flow through onto the loan documents, will flow through onto the title commitment and onto all of the closing documents. So if it's wrong from the beginning and nobody catches it, we may have a problem once we get to the closing table. So you wanna make sure you have the name spelled properly and put the marital status there. Then we move down to line number seven, that is the street address, pretty self-explanatory. Line eight is the county that the property is located in, plus to the right is the property tax ID number, which you know you can get from the property appraiser site or the tax collector site. The legal description, again, this is where you can copy and paste the short legal that is on the property appraiser's website. This is the only time you can do that. We know that on the closing documents and on loan documents, we need to have the actual full legal description, which you saw in a previous video, how to find the full legal description of the property. But in this case, you can copy and paste that short legal for the purposes of the real estate contract only. Next, we're gonna go down to line number 20. These are going to be personal property items that are included in the purchase. Anything that is personal property that is included in the purchase, sometimes it's listed in the MLS, you will put that on the contract in this section. And then the next section right below it, 23, are items that are excluded from the purchase price. And when the title companies and attorneys prepare the bill of sale, this is a lot of times the, the section that they're going to reference. Remember, this is all hand in hand. We need to review the contract just as much as you need to help the client draft the contract to make sure all of the terms are outlined in there so we know what to follow. So that's where you're gonna put any items that are excluded. Maybe a washer and dryer, a chandelier that maybe the sellers inherited. There's a lot of things on there that sometimes are included and excluded from the purchase. And these are the two sections that you wanna make sure you fill out properly. 
So now we're gonna to move to line number 26. That is the purchase price of the property. Again, very, very important to make sure we have this as accurate as possible. This is going to be the price that the seller is going to be receiving and the buyer is going to be paying for the property. Then line number 27 is the initial deposit. So it could be $10, could be $1,000, could be 10%, whatever the initial deposit required for the contract, the good faith deposit. Remember, for the contract to be valid, there has to be some consideration. So as little as $10, but a lot of times we see $1,000, $2,500, $5,000, or sometimes a little bit more depending on who the seller is and what they require. Then you're gonna check here, does the deposit accompany the offer, meaning it's being put up now, or is it going to be put up within three days of effective date of the contract? So in other words, do they need to put it in escrow today, or do they have three days to get that deposit wired or sent over to the escrow agent. Now remember, there's a difference here. Next line, we're gonna talk about the escrow agent information. This is the person that's holding the deposit, not the title company necessarily. It could be the real estate brokerage. It could be the attorney for the buyer or the seller. This is the person that will be holding the escrow deposit. You can put later on in additional terms who will handle the closing. A lot of times it is the title company, but it's not necessarily the title company. So here's where you wanna put the escrow agent information of who's holding the escrow deposit. Then we're gonna go down to line number 35. That's the additional deposit that is typically done 10 days after effective date, which we know is the last date all parties signed and deliver the contract to the other party. So we wanna make sure that within 10 days you get your second deposit in. A lot, a lot of times it's a little bit more than the first deposit could be the same as the first deposit, it could be no second deposit. So if there's a second deposit, that's where you wanna add that. Line number 38 is financing. So this is where we are going to talk about how much financing are you getting? Is it 80%, is it a dollar amount, 200,000, 100,000, whatever the uh, financing amount is. So if it's 80%, you take the purchase price times 80% and you will get yourself your loan amount. This is the section that you wanna add that to. Other would be maybe if you're getting a seller held second mortgage, any other types of credits, maybe a city grant or something that the borrower or the buyer will not have to come to closing with. So it could be maybe a city grant that you're getting a second uh, loan. That's where you're gonna add that information. And then we are going to move down to line number 40. This is the balance to close. So this is simple math. You take the purchase price up at the top and then you are going to subtract the first deposit, the second deposit, the loan amount, any additional credits that are going to be given, and that will then leave you with the balance to close, obviously plus reasonable and customary closing costs, which you can get from our title calculator, or you can call the, the uh, title company doing the closing to get that information from them directly. Now we move down to line 44 and 45. This is time for acceptance of the offer. So this is how long are you giving the seller to accept your offer? 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, maybe the seller's out of the country and it's five days, whatever it is. Here, if you do not put anything, it is going to be within two days after it is delivered. So you wanna make sure time, uh, time is of the essence. You wanna make sure you put a date in there. It makes it clear. I always tell people, if it says if left blank, just put something in there. Even if you put the same amount that it says if left blank, because you leave yourself room for someone to put information in there. So if you fill it out, you'll never have any questions. Closing date, very, very important. On line 52, that is going to be the day we are going to close the transaction. As I told you in previous videos, it's good to get the proper training to make sure if the buyer is getting a loan, you wanna try not to do it on the 15th or the 30th of the month because the lenders are busy, the brokers are busy, the title companies are busy. It's one of the busiest two days of the month. So you wanna try and maybe do it a week before, two days before, so it doesn't stop your closing from happening because a lot of times it gets delayed. They send the package late. They don't send the wire in time. And now we have a seller at the closing table thinking they're gonna get money, but then the transaction doesn't really fund until the following day. So it's very important to properly plan now to prevent problems later. So now let's move down. We're gonna talk about line number 68. This is if you are an investor buying a property subject to a lease. Someone is staying in the property, a tenant, you are going to check this box and we make sure that we have rents prorated, deposits prorated. We look at that as a title company to say, oh, there's a tenant in place. We need to prorate rents or prorate 
uh, deposits. We'll get a uh, tenant estoppel from the seller. They'll provide one to us showing what's been paid and what we need to collect at closing because you know that closing statement is a balance sheet. It's a checks and balances of that uh, deposits and, and rent that are, have already been paid by the tenant living in the property. Line number 77, number seven, very, very important for those investors out there. Either the buyer may assign or may not assign the contract. And then the second option is if the buyer is able to sign the contract, if they can assign it to another buyer, are they released from liability or not released from liability? A lot of times we see this where investors say, well, I assigned the contract. I want my money, my initial deposit back because the other person put up their deposit. And I say, well, if you're not released from liability, we can't release your deposit to you because you may have to step back in and close if your buyer decides to cancel. So it's very important to know whether the contract is assignable or not assignable. And then it's important to know whether you as the uh, initial buyer are released from liability or if you're not released from liability. Now let's move down to financing. This is one of the most important parts in the contract that has changed with the new contract. You can go back to previous videos where we talked about the two significant changes in the contract, one being the financing, the financing approval period. So here you're gonna see line 82, it's either very simple, the buyer's going to pay cash or they get a private loan for the property. And then line 86 is it's contingent upon a buyer getting approved for a conventional FHA or VA mortgage. And you will ask the mortgage lender, the person who provided your buyer with the pre-approval, the terms of the loan. Is it fixed or adjustable? What is the interest rate and the terms of the loan? Very important for buyers, line number 91. That is the time you have to make application. Pre-approval is not an application. Pre-approval just means you submitted information, they ran your credit and your income, and they said you are approved, pre-approved to buy a house approximately for this amount. You need to file an official application with the lender, and in this case, if it's left blank, you have five days. Five days may not be enough, so you wanna make sure you get that application in as soon as possible per the terms of your contract. All right, now we're going to go to the closing cost section of, of the contract. This is what is going to be reasonable and customary closing costs as a title company. We look at this to know who pays for what. So you're going to go down here to line number 145. That's title evidence. Usually it's 15 days. People leave it blank. Just put 15 days in there. It's not a problem. You can leave it blank. Uh, and then you can look at checking one item, line number 158, 162, and 164. Check one box, one of the three options. Many times we see people, they do not check anything or they check the wrong box or they check multiple boxes. Seller pays for title company in box 158, letter one. Then you go to two, which is line 162. It talks about buyer shall designate closing agent and pay for owner's policy and charges. And then the seller will pay for certain other charges. And then you go down to the third line, which talks about the Broward Miami-Dade Regional Provisional. This is the section that if you are in Broward or Miami-Dade, you'll check this section. That is in the best interest of all the parties. That tells us exactly who to charge what to as far as lien search, title search, title insurance, and who is selecting the title company. Line number 173, we're talking about home warranty. If you're an agent that provides a home warranty to a client, or maybe the seller provides a home warranty to the buyer, this is the section you wanna fill out to make sure the home warranty is addressed in the contract. So we know when we're preparing it, there's gonna be a home warranty. We need to ask for uh, an invoice for the home warranty, and we'll have the paperwork at closing to show to the buyer about the home warranty that they will be getting. Then we're gonna move down to special assessments. These are not condominium and homeowners association special assessments. These are municipal special assessments. It could be through the taxes. It could be uh, through one of the cities or the municipalities. It will tell us how we address the special assessments. Sometimes they assess something and then there's payments over the next 10 years to pay the assessment off. Sometimes at closing, the assessment is paid in full by the seller. So you need to check one of the two boxes. And it says here, if neither box is checked, then option A shall be deemed selected, which means the seller will pay installments due prior to closing. And then the buyer will assume the assessments after closing. So if you know there are assessments, address them in this section. And we know that the homeowners and the uh, condominium association assessments will be addressed later on in the 
uh, additional addendum, the condo and HOA addendum. The rest, we're going to basically be moving down through the rest of the contract down to line number 250 on page 5, which talks about right to cancel property inspection. Again, this is the second change in the contract where we know that permits and code matters need to be uncovered within the inspection period. It says that at the last part of this bold, where it talks about buyer accepts the physical condition of the property and any violation of governmental building, environmental and safety code restrictions or requirements. So we need to make sure that you are getting your lien search in within the inspection period or going down to the city to check for these matters because if a permit matter comes up later, you as the buyer may not be able to cancel the contract. The alternative is you can use the language that we've had drafted by an attorney that excludes the permit and code issues from the standard inspection period and has them due prior to closing, the seller will remedy any issues that may come up, which is the way it used to be many years ago. Now it, it's, it's slightly different. They've clarified in here a little bit more. So you want to make sure that you are ordering your lien search or getting that data within your inspection period. And if the buyer wishes to cancel the contract, make sure you do so before the inspection period is expired. Now we're going to move down. The rest is just standard terms and conditions. You can read through and always call our office if you need any clarification on anything. Or if you're a real estate agent, you can call your local uh, board. They could be happy to explain the contract to you. The rest we're going to get down to the bottom. Line number 568 on page 11. These are the addendums and additional terms. Some of the standards are a condominium rider. If there's a condominium, a homeowners association, maybe the seller is providing financing. If it's an FHA or VA loan, you'll check box number E, short sale, homeowner's insurance. If the buyer or seller need an attorney to approve the contract. If you're a real estate agent and you have a personal interest in the property, if you are licensed in selling or buying, you want to make sure you're selecting trip, uh, double A. If there's someone staying in the property pre-closing or post-occupancy, or maybe if you're a seller and you have to, the contract is contingent. If the buyer is buying, it's contingent upon that buyer selling their other property, this is the area that you want to check to make sure that all of your items are covered. A lot of the items are covered in the additional terms. You do not need to add additional language that you're worried may or may not be, be correct. So use the addendums. That's why they were drafted. That's why they explain a lot of the additional terms in the contract. Anything additional, line 20, that you need to add, maybe the buyer or seller need to pay a processing fee or, or uh, some type of additional commission or something, this is where you want to put that. If you want to exclude permit matters and code matters from your inspection period, this is where you are going to put it. Remember, anything included in the addendum trumps the items that are in the contract. So if you modify it in the addendum, that will supersede. So a lot of the banks, the contract says it's assignable, but the addendum says it's not assignable, and that means that the addendum will win. So you want to make sure that this is where you put any additional terms that you need to add to the contract or that either party would like um, added in you know, for the actual closing. Then we go down to the last page, very important, buyer and seller both need to sign and date. That's how we know the effective date of the contract. So make sure the buyers both sign and date and the sellers both sign and date all buyers and all sellers should be completing this information. Buyer's address and seller's address is very important for the settlement agent and the lender. It's good to put the buyer's name, which we have, the address, full address, maybe a phone number and an email address. It helps us communicate with them. If we need to go back and reach out to them later on, we look at the contract and it's there, as opposed to us having to keep asking for it, just include it in the contract. Buyer's name, buyer's address, buyer's phone number and email address. Then if you're a real estate agent getting a commission, this is where you want to put your commission. You want to put your name, your brokerage name, because remember commissions are payable to the brokerage. And then you want to put the percentage of your commission. A lot of times we'll see commissions were off because we assumed it was 6% and maybe it was 5% or maybe it was 7%. So here's where you want to clarify that because if you miss it on the closing statement, then you may have a problem collecting that money later. So you want to make sure if it's a 6% commission, you put 3% and 3% and that's what we'll follow when we prepare our preliminary closing uh, disclosure. And that's about it. That's a wrap for the contract. I hope you learned something new and today's video was a little lengthy. 
Hopefully you were able to learn something by following along in this contract. When you're filling out the contract, if you're a real estate agent, a buyer, a seller, you have a question, give our office a call. We'll be happy to guide you through some of the common things that we see when filling out a real estate contract here in the state of Florida. So give me a thumbs up if you learned something new. I always love comments below. If you like the video, give me a comment. If you have an idea for a future video, leave me a comment. I'd always love to hear that information so I can help produce better videos for next week's episode. So thanks for watching Title Tuesdays. My name's Kevin Thatcher signing off. I look forward to seeing you at the closing table.